diagrams that we draw capture all possibilities of overlaps between the three different properties that the argument contains. When we know a space is empty, we mark it by crossing it out. When we know a space is non-empty, we mark that by inserting a dot, which represents one or more objects. When a space is neither crossed out nor contains a dot, then we simply do not have information about whether it is empty or not. Then he returned. He returned with a box of roses to beg my forgiveness. He implored my forgiveness. But some things are not forgivable. Deliberate cruelty is not forgivable. It is the one unforgivable thing, in my opinion, and the one thing of which I have never, never been guilty. So I said to him, thank you. But then he returned. He returned with a box of roses to beg my forgiveness. He implored my forgiveness. We take C of X for X is deliberately cruel, F of X for X is forgivable, and G of X for X is something I am guilty of. Some things are not forgivable. Deliberate cruelty is not forgivable. It is the one unforgivable thing in my opinion. Our first premise is, all things that are deliberately cruel are not forgivable. And the one thing of which I have never, never been guilty. Our second premise is, all things that are deliberately cruel are not things I am guilty of. We may now wonder whether she is only guilty of forgivable things. We phrase this as, all things that I am guilty of are forgivable. Is this a valid conclusion? If we look at the diagram, we see that the space of things she is guilty of, not overlapping with any other space, is not crossed out, nor does it contain a dot. This means that our information is not sufficient to determine whether this space is empty or not. In other words, whether there exists things she is guilty of which are not forgivable. It follows that this is not a valid conclusion, as there is a possible counterexample. A thing she is guilty of which is not forgivable. And for the same reason, we can't tell that she is, in fact, guilty of anything that's not forgivable. We phrase this as, something I am guilty of is not forgivable, the negation of the previous statement. This is also an invalid conclusion because the same space could be empty. Thus, from what she says, it remains undecided whether she is guilty of unforgivable things or not. So I said to him, thank you. Mm. I'm an army man. I was, I was a soldier. Are all soldiers crazy? Oh, no. Soldiers are not crazy, but officers are. All the officers are insane. <laughs> hmm. I'm an army man. I was, I was a soldier. We take S of X for X is a soldier, C of X for X is crazy, and O of X for X is an officer. Are all soldiers crazy? Oh no! Our first premise is, no soldier is crazy. Or phrased differently, all soldiers are not crazy. Soldiers are not crazy, but officers are. All the officers are insane. Our second premise is, all officers are crazy. One may wonder here whether it follows that no soldier is an officer, which is the same as all soldiers are not officers. Is this a valid conclusion to draw? As we can see, the two spaces in the intersection of officers and soldiers have been crossed out and are therefore empty. The conclusion would be false only if there was here a non-crazy officer or a crazy soldier, but according to the premises this cannot be. Therefore, this syllogism is valid. Note that this conclusion is true even if there exist no soldiers at all. This brings us to our second tentative conclusion, namely, some soldier is not an officer. Since the space of crazy soldiers who are not officers is crossed out, for this conclusion to be true, 
there needs to be a sane soldier who is not an officer. But as the diagram shows, the premises provide no information as to whether this space is empty or not. In a situation where no soldiers exist, the argument becomes invalid. Note that one may tend to think that the second tentative conclusion follows from the first, and since the first argument is valid, the second one has to be valid too. However, we have just proven that the second argument is invalid. Indeed, in predicate logic, it does not follow from the truth of the statement that all A are B, that there exists some A that is B. This points out a difference between the Aristotelian analysis of syllogisms and the one following predicate logic. For the latter, the statement, all A are B, does not carry what is called existential import. You hold on to that. Yeah, sure, Doctor. Thank you. That's good. Now, every seventh grader, even the dumb ones, know the second law of thermodynamics. All ordered systems tend toward disorder. Disorder! So I'm going to ask you one more time, sir. What gives? You hold on to that. Yeah, sure, Doctor. Thank you. That's good. We take S of X for X is a seventh grader, D of X for X is dumb, and T of X for X knows the second law of thermodynamics. Now, every seventh grader, even the dumb ones, know the second law of thermodynamics. Our first premise is, all seventh graders know the second law of thermodynamics. Our second premise is, some dumb person knows the second law of thermodynamics. The second premise says that there is some dumb person who knows the second law of thermodynamics. This person could be a seventh grader or not. Therefore, with the second premise, the diagram splits. The first conclusion could be, some seventh grader is dumb. Is this valid? Well, the conclusion is true in the first diagram, since there is a witness in the intersection of seventh graders and dumb people. Thus, we know that there is a dumb seventh grader, who also knows the second law of thermodynamics. However, the second diagram allows for a counter-example. This is because the same space may be empty. If it is empty, then the statement is false, thus the argument invalid. All ordered systems tend toward disorder. Disorder! So I'm going to ask you one more time, sir. What gives? <laughs>